Okay, so let's get started talking about the organization of the nervous system. So the first thing we need to understand are the cells which are in the nervous system. So the cells of the nervous system, we can divide them into glial cells and also neurons. When it comes to the glial cells, they can either be microglial or macro, macro meaning big. Now the microglial, these are just the macrophages which are present in the central nervous system. And then the macroglio can be divided again into either astrocytes or oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells. Oligodendrocytes only present in the central nervous system. Schwann cells only present in the peripheral nervous system. Astrocytes, these are the ones which form what we call the blood-brain barrier. And they can either be fibrous or protoplasmic. So this will be the easy division of the cells of the nervous system. But this is going to be now more. We can see we have got the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The cells might be different, and that can come in M MCQ. But for the central nervous system, we have got the astrocytes. We have got the epidymal cells. Now, these epidymal cells, they line the ventricles of the, of the brain, and they are the ones which are going to be able to secrete Cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, those are the epidermal cells. And then oligodendrocytes, these are the guys which myelinate the axons in the central nervous system. And we can see that one axon can myelinate a lot. You can see it can do it here, it can do it also at that point. So it can actually myelinate a lot of ax axons, just one oligodendrocyte. And that can come as a question also. Also of the microglial, specifically in the central nervous system. And these guys are going to be able to fight uh, diseases. You can see these are basically macrophages in the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has got satellite cells and Schwann cells. So satellite cells are not in the central nervous system. They are in the peripheral nervous system. And these satellite cells, when you get to view under a microscope the, let's say, the cell bodies, you are going to see them at the periphery, at the end of cell bodies. So these ones are going to regulate just neurotransmitter levels. Let's say this nerve has to fire. So how much neurotransmitter, let's say the acetylcholine or the epinephrine it gets to release, these will be able to regulate. And then the Schwann cells, these are there for myelination in the periphery nervous system. So we can see here that for oligodendrocytes, you can have one oligodendrocyte which is myelinating different axons, but for a shunt cell, only one will be able to myelinate an axon. And then the epidermal cells, you can see they are packed together here, and those are going to be involved in the production of the cerebral spinal fluid in the central nervous system. So central nervous system, that is the brain and the spinal cord. And then the astrocytes, which are forming the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> so these will be the shapes. We, saw, we said the astrocytes can either be protoplasmic or fibrous. So this can be the shape. This is the protoplasmic. This is the fibrous. So we can see that the protoplasmic cells are larger. Even, of course, the fibrous ones are going to be larger. They are all over in shape. But then when it comes to color, the protoplasmic ones are going to be a bit of gray. The fibrous ones are going to be white. That is some histology about them for that sake. And then oligodendrocytes here, these ones are not that big. They are medium in size. But you can see that all of them, they look starlit. They look like a star in shape. Again. When you look at where are they going to be found, oligodendrocytes are going to be found in the white matter. We know these guys are involved in myelination. And the myelin is fat. And fat here is what forms that white thing that we are able to see. So they are found in white matter. And then the microgrow can either be found in gray matter and or white matter. 
So we can see here the blood-brain barrier that has been formed and then the pindymo cells here, which are on this side, we can see we have got the cerebrospinal fluid in the spinal cord. And then these guys are preventing the mixing of the blood and also the neurons there, these astrocytes here. As we already said, oligodendrocytes, you can have one oligodendrocyte myelinating a lot of nerves. But for the other one, which is the swan cells in the peripheral nervous system, only one can myelinate one nerve. It's important to understand also the pattern. As simple as this seems here, they can actually bring this one to be labeled. So we need to know the structure. So I've got the dendrite, a dendrite the cell body, nucleus on the cell body, the beginning of this of this nerve before we can go to the axon is the we have got the hiatus there. Okay, and then we have got the axon. We have got the myelin sheath, which is basically these same cells. So the swan cells are the ones which form myelination. And then we have got the nodes. So between each my lean sheath, there is a node of Ranvi, and then we have got the terminal of the axons at the end. So also this is important to understand. The cell body is also called the soma. The nucleus is going to be a very large one, which is euchromatic, and then it is spherical in shape and it is centrally located. You can just find the MCQ where they say, the nucleus in the cell body of the axon is eccentric, centric, and those things. So this one is actually on the middle, so it is centrally located. So we also have nissel bodies or nissel substance, which are composed of rough endoplasmic reticulum. So if we hear of nissel bodies, I've seen a question on this. It's composed of rough ER. And these ones are going to be basophilic, meaning that they're supposed to stay blue in color upon, let's say if we are using the H and E stain, they should stain blue with the H and E. So they should stain with the hematoxin, which is basophilic. Okay. And then you also have Golgi complexes and the Golgi bodies, these are going to be near the nucleus, near the nucleus. The beginning of the nerve here, before we can go to the axon, is the hyloc. I think I mentioned hilum instead of hyloc. So those dots that we see inside is going to be nissel board, which is basically rough endoplasmic reticulum in this in this nerve. So the Golgi apparatus is only in the cell body, but mitochondria can be found throughout the cell. So this is important to understand. I've even highlighted this because it can be found in a multiple choice. So Golgi apparatus is only present in the cell body or mitochondria can be anywhere. But how do we classify neurons? Neurons can be classified as either being unipolar, bipolar, pseudo-unipolar, or multipolar. Just looking at how many, looking at the cell body. So if we connect the axon at the end of the cell body, that is going to be unipolar. You can see we don't have dendrites for this cell body. And for such a neuron, examples where we can find it includes the mesencephalic nucleus. This is of cranial nerve, of the of five cranial nerve. So I've got it. These are going to be basically found in cranial nerves. Okay? Cranial nerves. Now we know that when you are making nerves, a nerve is basically a combination of so just these same cell uh, axons that we have. This is what is going to form the nerve in the central nervous system. <clears throat> and then when we have got the cell body, and then you have got either dendrites or axons. So you can have an axon and a dendrite, or both as axons or dendrites coming out. Two of them. That's bipolar. Examples we are able to find this is this one is going to be purely sensory. And by sensory meaning that is found in nerves which come outside out of the out of the central nervous system, going to the body and not motor. 
So these ones include the sensory cochlea, vestibular ganglia. So in other words, you need to know that it is sensory. Actually, sensory is supposed to go to the central nervous system. And then the pseudo unipolar pseudo, it looks as though it is unipolar, but it's actually not unipolar. You can see you have got two, uh, you have got a dendrite or an axon which are coming out, but then you are only connecting to the, to the cell body once. So that is pseudo unipolar. And these guys are going to be found in the sensory ganglia of the spinal cord. These are the ones which we, we are able to see a lot of times. You can see things like the when we are drawing a typical spine, okay, we are going to, to mention the typical spinal nerve. Do you have got things which come out as you are drawing? Something is going to come out if you can remember the structure of this typical spinal nerve. And then multipolar, these ones are going to be, far, these are motor neurons. And they are basically in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. So these are motor. Multipolar are motor neurons. And then bipolar, these are sensory neurons. So sometimes they can give examples and then they ask us to identify what kind of neurons are going to be found there. So pseudo unipolar found in sensory ganglia. A ganglia is a collection of cell bodies. And then different from this one, which is purely sensory, which is the bipolar. It can be found in anything that is sensory. Okay, so this is how a nerve is going to be made. You are going to have an axon, and then you have got a lot of axons put together, and then they're going to be surround. One axon is going to be surrounded by endoneurium. If you put a lot of axon together, they're going to be surrounded by a perineurium. And then if you put a lot of these together, they are going to be surrounded, and that will be by the epimetium. So you have got epi, peri, and then endo as EPA, ep. So this one is just telling us about the comparison of types of nail fibers. You have got the group A fibers, the group B, and the group C. The group A, they are the fast, they are the thickest, and they conduct very fast. Why? Because they are myelinated. Group B fibers, they have got a medium size. They are also myelinated, but they will not be as fast as the group A. Group C, these are the thinnest and slowest, meaning they are not myelinated. Something that is not myelinated is very much slow when it comes to conduction. So what happens if a nerve dies? Or let's say if a nerve is cut, how does it degenerate? So that is called the Valerian degeneration of peripheral nervous system axons. So the first thing that will happen is look at here, we have got the axon is severe. Look at this point here, it has been cut. And then what will happen is that the proximal portion of the severe axon is going to seal off and is going to swell. The distal portion is going to degenerate. So you can see, this is the part. So the, the, this portion was hit here. And then what happened was the proximal portion swell. So you can see this portion has swollen. And then the rest of the part, which was this side, is going to die off. That portion that is attached to the muscle is going to degenerate. And then after there, now the neuromyocytes are going to form, to, to form a regeneration tube. So first, a tube is going to be formed. We can see a tube that is appearing there. A growth of a regenerating tube that is appearing there. After that tube is appearing, then the next thing that, that happens is that the axon regenerates and it remyelinates. So the axon starts to grow now. You can see the axon is starting to grow. And then there's myelination that is getting to happen. And then you are going to have now re-innovation. So the axon has now reached back to the muscle where it would scatch. So that is called the Valerian regeneration. So these axons can synapse with other axons. A synapse is just a joining or meeting of axons. So these axons can meet with other axons. So you can see a cell body of one axon can meet with a terminal end of one axon, and that is called the axosomatic synapse because you are having the soma, which is the cell body, with the axon, so axosomatic. You can have the dendrites of one axon synapsing with the 
the axon of another axon. So that will be axodendritic synapse. And then you can have the axon of one axon uh, of one nerve synapsing with the axon of another nerve. So that will be axo-axonic synapse. So these are some injuries that can happen to the nerve. You have got a neuropraxia. So structure of the nerve is going to remain intact. And here, the nerve has been hit, but then the structure of the nerve remains intact. So recovery can be within days. And then the other one, which is the axonomesis. Here, this is going to be a bit severe. There's disruption of the, the, the axon. So the axon has been hit, but this toe connective tissue architecture remains intact. So that portion that attaches to the muscle is really not hurt. And then the neuromesis. This one is very critical. Here you have got a complete disruption of the nerve and the surrounding connective tissue. So the nerve has been hurt. The surrounding connective tissue has been hurt. So it is really bad for this one. So a surgical intervention has to be carried out. Now, talking about the nervous system, it can be split into central or peripheral. We know the central is the spinal cord and the brain, and then the peripheral. The peripheral are just any, all the nerves coming out of the central. It can either be autonomic or somatic. Autonomic is something that you can't control. Okay. So this one, the somatic has to do with internal organs and the glands. This is very important, internal organs and glands. So what innervates the internal organs is actually the autonomic and not the somatic. What innervates glands? Because you don't say, okay, it is now time to secrete sebum, secrete. No, you don't do that. So what you control that is the autonomic. So the autonomic can either be sympathetic or parasympathetic, while the somatic can be sensory or motor. Meaning you can either be taking the nervous system towards the central nervous system from let's say mostly a muscle or towards the central nervous system. So starting with the central nervous system, so first we need to understand a collection of neurons within the central nervous system is called the nucleus. Or a collection of neurons outside the central nervous system is called the ganglia. Correct? So these we are calling neurons, we are just talking about cell bodies. So cell bodies in the central nervous system is it? Nucleus, cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, ganglia. While nail fibers or axons in the central nervous system is a tract. And then nail fibers or axons outside the central nervous system, that is in the peripheral nervous system, is a nerve. So in the central nervous system, we don't have a nerve. We have got a tract. And then we don't have a ganglia in the central nervous system. We have got a nucleus. Okay. So we need to understand about gray matter and white matter. Yes, Doc. All right, all right. We'll do that. So the gray matter is made up of cell bodies. The white matter has no cell bodies. Okay. So for white matter, no cell bodies in the white matter. While in the gray matter, there are cell bodies. So you can see on this picture here, gray matter is made up of basically cell bodies. White matter is made up of just the axons. Okay. So now, the, for you to remember, how do you even remember? Because you might even confuse them. So just know that white matter is made up of axons. Axons are the ones which are myelinated. Myelin is a lipid. Lipids give the white color to the nerve. Okay, so where you have got white, just know that that's white matter and they should be the axon. Okay, so that is it. And then, so that is what we need to understand. Cell bodies are present in the gray matter, white bodies in the, I mean, white matter, you have got the cell bodies. So for the brain, the arrangement of the white matter and the gray matter is going to be different from the spinal cord. For the spinal cord, the cell bodies, the cell bodies are on the middle. So that is where we have got the gray matter on the middle. And then on the periphery, that is where we have got the white matter, meaning that is where we have got the axons. But for the brain, the axons are actually at the end. That is where we have got 
the the gray matter actually the the gray matter is the is at the end meaning that is where we've got the cell bodies and then the axons are on the central portion so it is important to understand this you know how multiple choice questions can come so white matter on the middle gray matter at the end that is for the brain spinal cord is going to be different opposite so starting look at the brain so the brain is going to mainly have two lobes and they're going to be separated by this chima space on the middle a chima deep space in the brain is called a fissure so this is a fissure now this fissure is separating like the front from the back i mean the left from the right this is known as a longitudinal fissure and then you also have sulcus. So what separates the brain in two different parts? You have got fissures and sulcus. A sulcus will separate the parts of the brain, but it doesn't go that deep. So for example, you have got the sulcus which separates the anterior from the posterior, and that is called the central sulcus. And then these things which come like on top, these things, not depressions, but uh, how do I even mention them? These things which go up like mountains, these are called gyrus on the brain. So I've got gyrus and fissures and also the sulcus. So the lobes of the brain are going to be named depending on the portion of the of this, uh, skeleton or the bone where they are going to be located. You can see the frontal is on the frontal bone. The parieto is on the parieto bones, the occipital on the occipital bones, and then the temporal on the temporal bones. So that is how you can name these parts. The brain is going to be divided into different parts. So mostly when you're dividing the brain, you have got... Let me just get a pen so that I get to write it. Okay, so the brain generally is going to be divided into the forebrain, and then the midbrain, and this is important to understand because they really emphasize, so they can really come, and then the hindbrain. So we need to understand these. So I've got four brain, mid brain, hand brain. Now, when the brain is glowing, these guys are going to have different names. As a brain is growing, these different parts are named differently. <coughs> now, when we are growing, we are not straight. We are actually like this. The, the head is like so. And then like, my baby is like this. So the portion which we call four brain is actually uh, somewhere here. Okay, and then the midbrain somewhere there, and then the hind somewhere there. So just like the way animals are, that is how it grow, and that is how the brain is going to be named. So for brain doesn't mean that it's going to be on top. Uh, it's going to be like, let's say in front. No, it's not in front. For me to say four, like um, if I'm standing, the four brain is not there. It's supposed to be on top. Like when we are growing, that's how they were named. <laughs> So as we are growing, the forebrain is known as a proencephalon. This one is known as a proencephalon. Proencephalon. And then the midbrain, the M, is known as the mesencephalon. And then the hindbrain is known as a rhombencephalon. So how do you even remember? So for me, the middle and the mess, we can see both are starting with M. And then what remains is the prosencephalon and then rhombencephalon. And I know that P, A, B, C, D, if you count like that, and O, P, Q, P. So P comes first in the alphabet and then you have got R. Four is first and then hind, just like the, the four gut and the hind gut. So the four brain is going to be 
prosencephalon, and then the Hindi brain is the rhombencephalon. So that is important to understand. Now, these four brain, what are the parts of the brain which makes up the four brain? Again, we need to understand that. So for the four brain, it is made up of basically two parts. We have got the biggest part of the brain, which is the cerebrum. This is the outer portion, which we can see, which is known as the cerebral hemisphere. The other one is called the diencephalon. So these are the two parts. Now, embryonically, these guys are also going to have their own names. The cerebrum is called telencephalon. And then the, the diencephalon is known as thalamencephalon. So these are the two which makes up the four brains. So the four brain is just the cerebrum. Uh, cerebrum and the diencephalon, okay, and then the cerebrum is going to be made up of two cerebral hemispheres. You are going to have two cerebral hemispheres if you separate this thing like that. You are going to have two hemispheres, and those hemispheres they are going to be divided each into four lobes, okay, and then the thalamencephalon is also going to be divided further. So remember, cerebral. Cerebrum is just the cerebral hemisphere, this biggest part of the brain. And then you have got the thalamencephalon, which is also called diencephalon. This one is going to be divided into different parts also. So this is where we're going to find the thalamus. So the thalamus is in the forebrain. Also the hypothalamus. There is also the epi thalamus and also the subthalamus so these guys are going to be found in the thalamencephalon so you can just remember like thala thala and most of these guys are thalas thalamus hypothalamus epithalamus subthalamus thalamus is the diencephalon okay all right so you can actually use a common mnemonic to remember that. So you say H, that is the hypothalamus, and then the E from the epithalamus, and then you can get the S, which is from the subthalamus, and then the T from the thalamus. So that's HEST. Those are the parts of the thalamencephalon. If you come to the midbrain, the midbrain is going to be made up of four different parts. So here I've got the first one being the cruz cerebri, cruz cerebri, and then you are going to have substantia nigra, substantia nigra. You are going to have tegmentum. And you're also going to have tectum. So you know multiple choice are very interesting. So these are going to be the parts of the midbrain. Cruz, cerebri, substantia nigra, tegmentum, tectum. These are the parts. If it comes to this tectum, this tectum is going to be made up of what is called the coli. So I've got the superior coli and then the inferior coli. The inferior coli, these ones are going to be, each one, there are two. So two superior coli and two inferior coli. The inferior coli, these ones are going to be like somewhere in the ear. And then these ones on the eye. Okay. So superior coli is related to the eyes. Inferior coli is related to the ears. A rhombencephalon, which is the hind brain. The hind brain is going to be divided again into two. It's going to be divided into the metencephalon and the myencephalon. So like that, metencephalon. And then the other one is a myencephalon. 
Now, the metencephalon, this one is what makes up. So it's actually the pons and the cerebrum. If you get the pons and the cerebrum, that is what forms the metencephalon. Myencephalon is just the medulla oblongata. So that's the name in embryonic origin, uh, as embryology is happening. So on the proencephalon, which is the forebrain, you have got two T's, telencephalon and thalamencephalon. On the rembencephalon, which is the hind brain, you have got two M's, which is the myencephalon and the metencephalon. That can be a bit tricky, but if you look at it now, you look at it the next minute, you look at it for the for the third time, it will be it will hold. It's important to know it. So those are the parts of the brain which we've talked about. And now these are the structures that we can see here. So let me ask, the cerebral hemisphere is part of which, part of what, what part of the brain? Cerebral hemisphere. It's part of which part of the brain? Cerebral hemisphere. Nothing? Okay. So the brain is going to be divided into different parts again. So we've seen how we've divided. The brain genera is going to have the forebrain, the hindbrain, and the and the uh, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. But then you also have what is called, you can also divide the brain into different passions because it has got the brain stem, the stem of the brain, the brain stem is just this same thing you can see here, like this my thing which is inside there. So it has got three parts. The brain stem has got three parts. It's going to have the pons. It's going to have the midi brain, and it's also going to have the medulla oblongata. So which ones are the pons? So look at here. I think we can see the, the entire of this. So we have got the diencephalon. Remember we said the diencephalon is part of the, the, this is like the forebrain together the cerebral hemisphere. But the brain stem itself, just the three parts, midbrain, and also some parts of the hindbrain. Now, we would have said midbrain plus hindbrain. We are not saying that. Why? It's made up of the midbrain. Instead of saying hindbrain, we are just getting the pons and the medulla oblongata. Why, so why are we not just saying hindbrain? Because we are leaving something here. We are leaving out the cerebellum. Cerebellum is not part of the... The cerebellum is this structure which is here. It's not part of the brainstem. So if we had these three structures, we would have said the brainstem is just the midbrain and the hindbrain. But then this structure is not there, so we are not going to say that. And again, we would have just said, okay, the brainstem is just, just the metencephalon. But we are not saying that. Why? Because the metencephalon is made up of the pons and uh, the cerebellum. The medulla oblongata is the myencephalon. So, but here we have got pons and medulla. So we can't say it is metencephalon. So this is what we can see here. You can see if we bring out what is inside there. We have got the diencephalon. The diencephalon, we have got the hypothalamus, which is this big part. You can see from the hypothalamus, we are having this come a small gland. What is the name of this gland? The pituitary gland. And then on top of the hypothalamus, you can see we have got the thalamus there. This portion between the diencephalon and the uh, and this down portion, that is the midbrain. So we have got the pons, which is the next part after the midbrain. And then you are going to have the medulla oblongata. 
from the medulla oblongata, we're going to go into the spinal cord. So I've got spinal cord, medulla oblongata, the pons, and then the midbrain. From the midbrain, now we have got the forebrain. This guy here, that's a cerebr cerebellum. So we already mentioned this, we've already talked about this. Okay. So tissue of the cerebral hemisphere, the outer layer we already said is gray matter. And that is the cortex. And then the deeper, which is the medulla, is made up of white matter, which is, remember white matter, we said for it to be white matter, it means it is made up of lipids. And lipids are surrounding basically the nerves. So this one is just made up of nerve fibers. And we said nerve fibers in the central nervous system, that's a tract. Okay. So the basal nuclei, are going to have something called the basal nuclei. These are located deep within the white matter. They are an exception because white matter should only contain fibers. So we have got actually nuclei. And we said nuclei is what? Cell bodies. So cell bodies are supposed to be found in the gray matter. But then these guys are found in the white matter. So in the brain, these are an exception. Basal nuclei. So that is important to take note of. Basal nuclei is an exception in the brain. It's found in the white matter. While other nuclei are actually found in the gray matter. Okay. So we also have meninges of the brain. Now the meninges of the brain are just the covering. This is important to understand. Meninges of the brain are just the coverings of the brain. So if you are coming, like if you remove the skull, you are going to find dura matter. And then the next you are going to find is arachnoid matter. And then the next one you are going to find is bio matter. So I abbreviate this as DAP, starting from top going down. Dura matter, arachnoid matter, bio matter. So the space between the bio matter and the, uh, the, the arachnoid matter and the bio matter. So the space between these last two. It is called the subarachnoid space. And you are going to find the cerebral spinal fluid there. So you can see the dura matter, which is this region here. And then you are going to have the pia matter, which is the next covering. And then you are going, I mean the arachnoid matter. And then you are going to have the pia matter, which is the end. So there is a potential space where you are going to find the cerebral spinal fluid. It's important to understand that as a multiple choice. Just take note of. And this diagram. Whether you want it or not, should be in your head. This one, you definitely have to have it in your head. So remember, we have said the brain is made up of the forebrain, midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain has got the cerebrum. Okay. And also, apart from the cerebrum, what else do we have on the forebrain? We also have the diencephalon. And then from there, we're going to have now. So these two parts are part of the forebrain. And what is the embryonic name for the forebrain? Bronchicephalon. Bronchicephalon. And then we'll go to the midbrain. Embryonic name? Mensencephalon. We shouldn't confuse it to say it is metencephalon. It's mensencephalon. And then now, after the midbrain, now we're going to go to the forebrain. The forebrain is made up of three parts. Bones, cerebellum, medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata is supposed to continue with the spinal cord down. So now in the cerebrum, we have ventricles. Okay, We have got two lateral ventricles. We have got the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. So we have got four ventricles in the brain. The Two lateral ventricles are found in the cerebrum. This is important to understand. Trust me, this diagram. If it doesn't come, then they will bring multiple choice questions from it. So where are the two lateral ventricles found? In the cerebrum. And then the third ventricle is found in the diencephalon. What's the other name for diencephalon? It's cephalomencephalon. That is the embryonic name. Thalamencephalon. Take note of that. And then the cerebrum is also known as the telencephalon. Telencephalon. Okay, so the, 
the third ventricle is found in the diencephalon. And then the fourth ventricle is actually found in the pons. Okay. You can see between, you have got the pons first and then the medulla oblongata. So the fourth ventricle is found where, where you have got it, between the pons, medulla oblongata, and the cerebrum, between these three structures. So basically in the hind brain. Now the connection between the third, the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle is known as the cerebral aqueduct. Don't forget this. And then the connection between the fourth ventricle and the spinal cord is known as the central canal. So cerebral spinal fluid is going to continue from the lateral ventricles, is going to go to the third ventricle, through the cerebral aqueduct, it will go to the fourth ventricle, and then it will go to the cerebral canal, and then it is now in the spinal cord as the cerebral spinal fluid, and then it will continue down the spinal cord. Please, this structure, I, re I say it again. All these parts, I think they're not hard. They should be in our head. This structure can come just the way it is to be labeled. Hope it is good. If, if there's something to be asked, please be free. Where is the third ventricle found? Diencephalon. If you don't find diencephalon, how should you find thalamencephalon? Where is the two lateral ventricles found? In the cerebrum. If you don't find that, you should find the telencephalon. Okay. The combination of telencephalon and thalamencephalon forms the proncencephalon. All right. So this is another view that we can see. You can see the two lateral ventricles there. We have got the third ventricle, and then we have got the fourth ventricle. And then this is the cerebral aqueduct. And then this is the central canal going to the spinal cord there. So remember we said cerebral spinal fluid is formed by ependymal cells. Now these ependymal cells are going to be together as an epithelium. They are together, together, a lot of them as an epithelium. And that is called the choroid plexus. Okay, so what produces cerebral spinal fluid is the colloid plexus. What is the colloid plexus? Just the ependymal cells together, which are together, like an, just like the same way epithelium is. So these guys are inside the ventricles, okay, inside the brain. And that is where cerebral spinal fluid is going to be produced, where inside the ventricles. That is important to understand. So cerebral spinal fluid can actually flow. You can see the way it is moving. It is produced in the ventricles. It will go around. You can see it can also go up into the arachnoid space. It can go like that. It comes and it can also flow down into the central canal, going to the spinal cord. So it can flow around the spaces in the brain. And then the spinal cord. One thing important to note about it is 42 to 45 centimeters long. Very important. It is going to extend from the foramen magnum. This is a space in the bone of the head. This space here, foramen magnum. That is where it is going to start. Okay. And then to the, dis the junction between the first and the second lumbar vertebra. This is very important. So the brain is, the spinal cord is going to end on the junction between the first and the second lumbar vertebrae, not thoracic, lumbar vertebrae. That is going to be in adults. But in children, the spinal cord is much longer and it ends on the third lumbar vertebrae. What should be the reason? Look at this. Let's say this is in a child. This is in a child. This is the third lumbar vertebrae. But then in an adult, you find that it is ending on here between one and second lumbar vertebrae. The reason for that is that the, the, the spinal cord is normally not growing. It's not changing, but the bones are growing. So the bones are becoming bigger and bigger. And so where the third portion was, it actually grows going down. And so you end up with the, brain, the spinal cord ending on the 
first and second junction of the lumbar vertebrae. But in children, it's still on the third. So this is going to be important when you want to perform a lumbar puncture. So in, an, in adults, you need to make sure that you perform the lumbar puncture above, below the first and second lumbar vertebrae. So I'm going to look for the space between the, after the second space. So like maybe the space between the third and fourth, or the space between fourth and fifth. But you not go, now fifth, you not go to the, I'm going to mention that more so that we don't just confuse things. So the end of the spinal cord is called the conus medullaris. That is where the spinal cord is going to end. Okay, conus medullaris. Nerves are going to lie almost vertically. So at the end here, nerves like go down. And that will be around what is called the filum terminal. Okay, we are going to have the nerves which are going down, straight down. That's called the filum terminal. And then the end of the spinal nerve is called the caudo equina. So these nerves which are at the end, they are called the caudo equina. And the caudo equina is going to be made up, made up of the nerves from L2 to L5. So L2, L3, L4, L5, and then also the sacral nerve 1, and then cos, cos, uh, coccyx nerve 1. So I've got the lumbar nerves L2 to L5. And then sacral nerve number one, like you are only having a sacral nerve here. And then also cosix cos nerve. So it's important to understand this, what makes up the cauda equina. L2 to L5, S1, C, O1. Very important. Now differentiate the end of the spinal cord is different from the end of a spinal nerve. The end of the spinal cord is the conus medullaris. The end of a spinal nerve is cauda equina. So if you cut the spinal cord on the middle, this is what you'll be able to see. You can see you have got different uh, horns. You have got the horn which is in front here. How do you tell that it's in front? You just see a very big fissure. So if you see something that goes very much deep, it's called a fissure. And then at the posterior side, it's not a fissure. It's called a sauker because it's not that deep. Remember what we said. Something that is very deep is a fissure. Something that is less deep is a sauker. So on the posterior side, you have got a sauca. It is not that much deep. Immediately you see that just know that that's a posterior. On the anterior, you have got a fissure. So you have got this horn. It's called the anterior gray horn because that's having gray matter. And then you have got the posterior gray horn. You also have the lateral gray horn. Now the lateral gray horn is specific for where the, some, uh, the autonomic nervous system is. Because autonomic nervous system, autonomic nerves will actually come from the lateral gray horn and not from anything else. So that is important to understand. And then you have got nerves can come out from the posterior side. So I've got a root that comes out. Remember when you are having nerves coming out of the spinal cord, they'll start as roots, they'll go as trunks, and then they'll continue as the rest as divisions. You're going to have the cords. I'm going to have the branches. So I've got dorsal roots, roots coming from the behind, and then ventral roots, roots which are coming from the front. Now on the dorsal side, you can see I've got sensory nucleus, basically sensory. And then on the ventral side, you have got motor. This is important to understand. Okay, Where do sensory move, sensory nerves go? Do sensory mo nerves move out of the spinal cord or they go towards the spinal cord? Which ones are sensory and which ones are motor? Between A and B. So motor is going out, sensor is going towards. And that should be the opposite. Okay. So let me just talk about this one. You can give what is called spinal anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia, you want to make sure that the caudo equina, these nerves which come down, they stop functioning. So what you do is you look at your where the this pubic crest ends, on top of the pubic crest. 
if you follow the top of the pubic crest, the top part is going to be L4. So you are just going to move like one step up, okay? The top part is going to be L4. If you find the space, if you go up, it means that, like you are going to be feeling it, you are going to feel the, the spinous process of L4. If you just come on top of the, of this crest, feel the spinous process of L4. If you just move one step up, you are going to feel the spinous process of L3. If you move a step down, you are going to feel the spinous process of L2. Okay, so you can do your you can you can punch. You can inject your Anastasia between L3 and L4, or between L4 and L5. So these two spaces you can inject there. Remember the spinal cord in an adult is going to end like between the first and the second spinal nerves. I mean lumbar vertebrae. So meaning between L3 and L4 is going to be safe because the spinal cord has already ended. If I punch between L2 and L3, I might injure the, the, spinal, the spinal cord. And any injury to the spinal cord, it might be very bad. A person might not even be able to move. But in in children, we know that the spinal cord ends at what? At L3. So in children, I shouldn't punch between L3 and L4. I should do it between L4 and L5. I want to do it away from the spinal cord. So that is very important. So a spinal anesthesia, I just want to to paralyze these nerves. Let's say, for example, you are, uh, there's giving birth, so I want to paralyze the nerves, starting from the umbilicus going down. Okay, so what you do is that when you give this injection, you can, like, if you prick someone on top, on top, above the umbilicus, they should feel the pain because this, this nerve shouldn't, I mean, the, the spinal anesthesia should not go up. The reason is you want to do it this side to paralyze the nerves which are down. Why? If you paralyze the entire body, you are going to also paralyze the muscles which aid in breathing. And so a person will not be able to breathe. They'll end up dying. So that's why we want only to paralyze the bottom part. So after doing the spinal anesthesia, if you prick a person on top above the, above the umbilicus, they should feel pain. But if you prick them down, they shouldn't feel any pain. Now, the difference between a spinal anesthesia and the lumbar puncture is the lumbar puncture is used to collect cerebral spinal fluid so that you you, perform, you carry out an analysis. Spinal anesthesia is you are injecting so that you paralyze nerves. So nerves which come out of the spinal cord, these are like peripheral nerves. So what is important, some these you need to understand when you talk about the body parts depending on the region where you are you are going to have different dermatomes now dermatome is just a nerve which is supply, supplying a region of the body and the important ones we need to know is the one on the nipple at least is t4 on the nipple and then on the umbilicus also this is also important it is t10 so actually, if you are, if you, if you, you have, if there is a problem with, let's say, the pancreas, uh, the appendix, the appendix is supplied by like the same nerve, T10. So if there is pain on the appendix, the pain can be referred to the umbilicus. So at least these ones we need to understand them. These are these two at least they are important. You can look at the others too, to just look at them. But these two at least we need to have them. These are common ones which are on this table should, should be able to know. And then we need also to know cranial nerves. Very important. All the cranial nerves, we need to know them. So I've got 12 cranial nerves. Only one of the two athletes felt very good, victorious, and happy. So you can use that mnemonic to remember all this. Only one of the two athletes felt very good, victorious, and happy. So the first one, the now you have got two, three ox, or three O's, not oxygen. So you have got first olfactory. Olfactory has to do with smelling. You know you only have one nose, so that should be the first. 
and then optic nerve that is for vision you know we have got two eyes so that should be the second two second and then the next is uh, also going to the eyes the oculomotor so after you do the olfactory and then the optic you just know that the oculomotor is going to be the next nerve because the for you the debate should be between the optic the oculomotor and the olfactory which one is going to be the first cranial nerve olfactory has to do smelling should be first one knows optic light it has to do with eyes vision that should be a second and then what remains ocular motor should be the third and then you have got two t's which one should be the first well try geminal remember should always be five try three so i've got three nerves coming from the fifth nerve that's the meaning of try it will always be the fifth one just remember try is always the fifth nerve so what remains the trochlea is the fourth and then the next is the abducens abducens this one will control the eyes facial nerve facial expression it also goes to the test bars and then vestibular cochlea this one is coming from vestibular and cochlea vestibular is balanced cochlea is hearing it's involved in balance and hearing glossopharyngeal these ones are going to go to our test buds okay glossopharyngeal vegas we've been talking about it this one has got a lot of innovation it will go to the GIT and the lot to those uh, internal organs. And then you have got the accessory nerve. The accessory nerve, this one is going to innervate. Mostly the biggest muscle that we know are innervated by this one. What is this it's my big muscle here? So I've got a very, very big muscle. What, that is try, try. Let's hope I've not forgotten the name of the muscle. Okay, we have got this big muscle at the back, which goes like this. Which forms like four parts. What's the name? Okay, so that's the name of that. that, that this is going to be innovated, but I've forgotten the name. I, I don't know how the name has gone. I'm going to remember it. And then I've got the hypoglossal. This one is involved in swallowing. Hypoglossal, you can even hear from the word glossal. Okay, has to do with the, the tongue. So this one has to do with swallowing. And then you need to know that which one of these nerves is sensory, which one is motor, which one is both sensory and, and motor. Oh, thank you very much. So this is a trapezius. Thank you okay so we need to know which one is sensory motor and both so the mnemonic to use is you know these things are a lot so you, some mnemonics help some say marry money but my brother says big brains matter most so the s is for sensory the m is for motor for b is for both so as long as you know this mnemonic in order you also know this mnemonic in order you'll not miss so some say marry money but my brother says big brains matter most so i think we have heard ladies big brains matter most are not money okay so let's take note of that uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. One thing, that, one thing that you need to take note of is this. It's very important. When it comes to these cranial nerves, what should we note about them? There are some cranial nerves which are specific, like which are going to the eyes. And if you can see, a lot of these cranial nerves are going to, like cranial nerve number two is going to the eyes. Okay, for vision. Cranial nerve number three is going to the eyes. And then cranial nerve number, uh, if we see number four is also going to the eyes. You just keep number five. Number six is also going to the eyes. So you can see, actually also for the for the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve number five, it has got a part that is also going to go there. So you can see like so just starting from two up to six, you can just exclude the four. So all these guys are going to the eyes. So take note of that, two, three, four, six, dedicated to the eyes. And also I mentioned the cranial nerve number five has got 
remember it's trigeminal, meaning it has got three nerves. It has got the ophthalmic division. And this one is also going to be going to the eye. So basically all the nerves from two to six are going to the eyes. But then for the fifth one is specifically the ophthalmic. And also this one is important to understand this table which is here. Cranial nerve. So we are moving like it. It's very easy to remember. Remember I've talked about the brain. The brain has got a forebrain, midbrain, and the hindbrain. Okay, like that. Now for the hindbrain, we know that it is made up of the myencephalon and the metencephalon. What I'm just saying is that the midbrain is going to be made up of the ponzi, the medulla, and the or med medulla oblongata, and also the cerebellum. So for the hind brain, I'll not get it at the, as in the brain. Instead, I'll get the pons, which is the metencephalon. And then I'll also get the oblongata, medulla oblongata. Okay. So the medulla oblongata together with the... Uh, the okay, this is just medulla oblongata here alone and the pons alone. So we don't have the cerebellum here. So the divisions, where do each one of these, like where are their nucleus located? Because these guys are coming from where? They are coming from the brain. They are like cranial nerves, cranial. You have got 12 cranial nerves as pairs, and then you have got 31 pairs of four spinal nerves. But for the spinal nerves, there are no special names to know. Cranial nerves, there are 12. We need to know them, and we've talked about them. So cranial nerve 2 and I mean one and two, starting one and two. These ones are coming from the forebrain. And then uh, three and four, which are the next, are coming from the midbrain. So the first two, you are getting two to one and two forebrain. And then three and four, midbrain. And then for the next, starting from five to twelve, you are going to be getting four, four. So starting from five, six, seven, and eight, these are coming from the pawns. And then nine. 10, 11, and 12. These are coming from the medulla oblongata. So this is important to understand. Remember when we showed the brain, the pawns were actually on top. And then as we went down, we had now our medulla oblongata. So we're actually moving for the forebrain was very much on top. Midi brain was the next. And then we come to the pawns, which are next. And then the medulla oblongata, which is next. So it's not even mastering. It's just knowing the order of how this parts of the brain are flowing and then you'll know which nerves come from where the first two come from the forebrain next two from the midbrain next four from the pons next four from the medulla oblongata is that okay okay i i bet that's okay now these nerves can either be somatic or autonomic. Every time we hear autonomic, it means it is either going to glands or it is going to internal organs. Somatic is going basically to muscles. Okay. Now, for the somatic, we have got a general somatic afferent. Afferent means we are going towards the central nervous system. Okay. So the general somatic, now these are somatic, going towards the central nervous system. So these ones are going to be sensations like for pain, temperature, touch, pressure, and those things. So where are they coming from? Skin, muscles, tendons, joints. These are what? These are automatic. You can see we are, we are not having glands here and we're not having any internal organ here. So here, if you hit your skin, you actually feel pain. And that is going to be carried by the general somatic. And then you are going to have general somatic efferent. Now efferent is moving away from the central nervous system. So these are basically cranial nerve 2, uh, cranial nerve 3, 4, 3, 4, 6, 7. And then you have got the visceral ones. Visceral ones are going to mucous membranes, the glands, and the blood vessels. Okay. And then you have got the efferent, like efferent going towards these structures. They are going towards smooth muscles, cardiac muscle, and glands. Just no efferent is towards, efferent is away.
So we have got a reflex arc. Reflex arc is a functional unit of the nervous system which can perform an integ uh, integrated neuronal activity. So what you are going to have first is a receptor, for example, a skin. And then you are going to have sensory afferent. Remember, sensory is going towards the central nervous system to sense. And then motor you are going now towards the structure, so it is efferent away from the central nervous system. And then you have got an effector. The effector is where the motor nerve is going for to be able to feel the pain. So the involuntary motor response is called a reflex action. So the action is you step on a needle and then you you come, you remove your leg. So that is what? That is a reflex action. Okay. So we need to understand a typical spinal nerve. Very, very important. Typical spinal nerve. It, it can actually just come draw a typical spinal nerve or they can bring it for us to, re, to label. So we have got the dorsal root and the ventral root. Dorsal root is on the behind. How do I know which one is ventral, which one is the uh, dorsal? I'll just look at the fissure. If I just see the fissure, it means that it's a front because at the posterior, we have got a sauca, just like a small space. So if you see from the behind, you're having what? You're having the dorsal root. And the dorsal root is sensory. Please take note of that. Very important. Dorsal root is sensory. If we say sensory, it means that it is afferent. It goes. Fibers take information towards. Now, for the ventral root, it is motor. We are taking information away. Okay. So, the ventral root, if you look at the dorsal root, the dorsal root is going to have a ganglia. If you are drawing the typical spinal nerve, don't forget about the dorsal root ganglia. So there's a ganglia here. Now the ganglia is before these two join, these two roots join. Okay, that's a ganglia. And that is called dorsal root ganglia because it's on the dorsal root. And we said the ganglia is the collection of what? Cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Now we know that when roots join, let me help us remember. Remember to drink cold beer. So when roots join, you are going to form a trunk. A trunk is what we call a nerve. Trunk. So when the dorsal root and the ventral root join, we are going to form our spinal nerve, which is just a trunk. Spinal, uh, the trunk that is going to be formed when you combine these two roots. Very important. Now look, information is coming like from the ventral direction. It goes like that. It goes like this. It will come and pass via the YT remi communicates, it will go to this structure which is called the sympathetic ganglion. Sympathetic ganglion. And then it will go back via the gray remus communicates. This is very important. Look at this. It, it didn't just come direct like this. And then it went like this. No, it didn't do like that. It went like this. And then it rounded. And then it came like this. So... The arrow is always going to enter from the white remus communicants. Okay, it is entering by the white remus communicants, and then it goes to the sympathetic uh, ganglia, and then it will go back via the gray remus communicants. So, since this is gray and this is white, which one do you expect to be myelinated and which one should not be myelinated? So the white should be myelinated. Remember, those are multiple choice questions. And then after then, now the fiber will come out. So just at this point, you can see you have got fibers which can actually move out. Now, remember, this is the posterior side. So you can have the dorsal. Dorsal means posterior. Dorsal remus. And this one which continues is the ventral remus. Why? Because it's going in front. Okay. That division is going in front. You have got a division which is going behind. Now, for the division which is going behind, which is the dorsal remus, you, you are going to have a division that is going to go like this. You are going to have a division which is going to go like that. So, you are going to have two divisions. You are going to have the lateral division and the medial division. 
So this one you can see it is like going away from the spinal cord. That is the lateral. This one actually was supposed to be like going to this direction a bit. Okay, so that is going to be the medial. Take note of that. You have so the dorsal ramus is going to divide into medial and lateral. We are going to have one. These are branches. We are going to have remember we moved from all the way from the nerve itself. It went to the ramus. So from the ramus, we are going to have the branch which can either go. This is supposed to be like going medially. Just a drawing here. Don't let it confuse you. This one is much longer. It is going away from the spinal cord. That is the lateral. So I've got a lateral branch and the medial branch. And then if you come now to the ventral, this one which is going in front. The one which is going in front, it will give these branches which are going to our muscles. So these are muscular branches. Now it will also divide. Look at this. This branch is going away from the spinal cord. So that is the lateral branch. And then this one is going in front. It is continuing to go in front. That is called the mid. This is supposed to be actually the okay, it's anterior branch here. Yeah? So you have got the, the lateral and the, the anterior because it's going in front. Lateral because it's going away from the spinal cord. And then from there, the lateral one is also going to divide. The lateral cutaneous, this is cutaneous because it's going to the skin. So I've got lateral cutaneous branch and the, the anterior cutaneous branch. So you're going to have a branch that is going to the behind. So that is a posterior branch of the lateral cutaneous branch. And then this one is the anterior branch. Okay. And then you are going to have also this one which was the anterior branch you are going to have this one which is going medially so that's the medial branch and this one which is going laterally so please take note of that those parts they can bring this to be labeled or they can ask us to or they can ask us to actually get to draw it nerve plexuses so the only nerve plexus that we talk about a plexus is formed by a ventral and dorsal ramus. So if you combine the ventral and dorsal ramus to form a plexus. So what we are interested in here is just the brachial plexus. The lumbos the lumbosacral of course supposed also talk about it also the sacral plexus but talk about the brachial. We already know this plexus. So let me not even waste time on it. It's made of C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1. You can see when the roots for C6, C5 and C6 join, we form this trunk. And this trunk is up. So it's an upper trunk. C7 continues along as the middle trunk. And then C8 and T1 will join to form the lower trunk. Now from all of these trunks, we're going to have anterior and posterior divisions. All the posterior divisions are going to merge. All the posterior divisions are going to merge. And from a trunk, we go to the division. So we're going to form the posterior division. And then the anterior division of the upper trunk and the middle trunk are going to merge to form this division. Now, this division is on the lateral aspect. So that is the lateral, uh, that's the lateral division. And then we are having also this one, which is continuing here. Where is it coming from? From C5 and T1. It continues down there. And then from divisions, we're going to have nerves, different nerves. Important nerves from the upper one that we need to remember, muscular cutaneous. And then, of course, this one is going to again merge. So the upper cord or the lateral cord actually is going to merge with the medial cord giving us one nerve one common nerve median nerve so let's let this not be something that should confuse you you have got data you are very much data for okay so median nerve every time you see an m it means the upper one is muscular median and then Auna. And then it is the one on the posterior to give you auxiliary and radio. 
It is important that you know where these guys are coming from because in the makeup test that we had, they brought right about the course and relations of the radio nerve starting from the beginning till the end. So you state from which, from where it's coming from. So you need to state it's coming from C5, C6, C7, C8, C8 and T1, and then mention everywhere it is passing, structures that it is going to PA, structures that it's going to innovate until you reach where the hand is. So that is how it came the makeup. So you see, anything is possible, okay? So this guy, this radio nerve is going to pass, it was going to continue, it will actually go on the scapula, it was going to pass in what is called the quadrangular space. From the quadrangular space is going to uh, round, actually it's going to pass not in the quadrangular space, what passes in the quadrangular is going to be the axillary. It's going to go in the uh, triangular interval, it follows what is known as the radio groove together with the profunda brachial artery, it will continue down, it will pass down on the, where I've got the cubital fossa, it is going to innervate, the radio nerve is going to innervate muscles on the posterior compartment of the, which one is arm and which one is forearm? Okay, on the posterior compartment of the brachialis, this upper portion, that will be the triceps brachii, and another muscle, what should be that one? That should be the brachialis, if it's not on the posterior. And then it will continue going on the posterior aspect, going on the side of the big thumb. And then it will innervate a lot of muscles also in that region as it moves towards on the posterior aspect near the thumb. And then it will reach on the hand where it will give sensory innervation to the just the, like half of the hand, not the portion that we used to touch, but the dorsum part. That would be like half on the lateral half of the hand. So we need to know the course of these nerves, like the course from the beginning till the end. Okay, so we see what to actually divide these trunks will be this big artery here. What is the name of this artery? So we have got this big artery here that is going to go together. You can see the, the axillary artery is going to, because we had first the subclavian, subclavian gave us axillary, axillary now is giving, is going to give us, is going to give us the brachial break, artery. Please, you need to know at which point does the subclavian change into axillary? At which point does the axillary change into brachial artery? Please know that. We are going to have the uh, first rib and then teresi major. So that's where these are going to be changing. So you can see that the posterior trunk is actually passing behind the axillary artery. Okay, so that is important to take note of that. So here is something that might come in the exam. You can look at it. Okay, I think we've talked enough. So you can have winging of the scapula if one of the nerves of the brachial, if one of the nerves of the brachial plexus has been injured. What nerve is that? What nerve is that? No answer. So long thoracic nerve which innervates the serratus, it should be the serratus, serratus anterior. If that nerve has been hurt, you are going to have winging of the scapula. You can see here you have got wrist drop. So wrist drop is caused when there is an injury on the radio nerve. You can use the mnemonic doctor coma. So this is drop, it's radio nerve. Okay, claw hand on a nerve. And then you have got the, the median nerve. This will be like the hip, hip hand. You can see if the, if the humerus, the shaft of the humerus has been broken, has been injured, the radio nerve can be hurt. Apart from the radio, uh, radio nerve, also the profunda brachial artery can be hurt, hurt because these two structures move together. But if I'm talking about the surgical neck, what rounds the surgical neck? The artery is posterior circumflex humeral artery 
and then the nerve is the axillary. So these two, if there is a surgical ne neck injury, these two structures can be hit. And you should be able to tell what should happen. For the radial nerve, if the radial nerve has been hit, then you are going to have wrist drop. So if you have got a fracture on, the, on this structure, you are more likely to have a wrist drop. Okay, I'm going to skip these. Just look at some questions. It's a lot. Okay, let's look at these questions. And I'll specifically go to what we've talked about. Let's start with this one. Which vertebral level? These are all from exam questions. I, I think I need to just mention this so that we it's it's easy. The sympathetic nerves. The sympathetic nerve can you I mean, the autonomic nerves can never be sympathetic or parasympathetic. Sympathetic is known as thoracolumbar because, like, you have got the thoracic nerves and the lumbar nerves. Parasympathetics are also known as craniosacral because they are made up of cranial nerves and sacral nerves. Okay, so these are the ones we have. We have got the, on the parasympathetic, you remember of saying parasympathetics. One thing that helps me to remember parasympathetics, I always think of the vagus. Vagus is parasympathetic. I know that vagus is a cranial nerve. So if I know vagus is cranial nerve and is parasympathetic, cranial parasympathetic, I remember, okay, it's cranial sacral. So cranial sacral is parasympathetic. And then what remains is it going to be thoracolumbar. Okay. So for the parasympathetic nerves, you have got the ciliary a ganglia, submandibular, sphenopalatine, and otic ganglia. Please, these ones you need to know. Ciliary ganglia goes to the eyes. Okay, basically. Submandibular will go to these ones which control saliva, like the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. You are also remaining with one salivary gland, which is the parotid. The parotid, it is going to receive innervation from the otic ganglia. Otic ganglia. Now, these ganglia they are coming from cranial nerves 3, 7, and then you have got what number is this? 11, and then you have got 9. So, like these are special numbers 3, 7, 9, 11. We're moving like in what numbers are these? What do we call them? Even numbers or even numbers, odd numbers, I mean, and they are all prime numbers. Oh, it's a, it's a wrong number. It's also seven. I thought it's, what number is that? Yeah. Yo, so th this one, the way they are, this is important to understand. Three, seven, three, seven. Ah, just check this again. I'm suspecting there should be something wrong. Three, seven, nine. Ciliary is coming from oh, three, submandibular. So let's note. What ganglia is going to go to the crane uh, to the parotid salivary glands? Otic for the other salivary glands is going to be submandibular, and then the lacrimal gland, these ones, lacrimals should be about tears and those things. These ones is the pterygopalatine, also known as this phenopalatine. So just take note of that. Okay, these are the ones you can see. Parotid glands, we are saying these are going to be coming from the aortic. And then these two are submandibular. These are the ones we can see. You can see the ciliary ganglia is basically to the eyes. The aortic ganglia is going here to the parotid glands. And then the pterygopalatine is going to the lacrimal glands. Okay, and then the submandibular down there. And this diagram, we, please go and look at it. This diagram can come for, for us to label. Go and look at it. It can come. It mostly comes on that section for, for the structure. Planknic nerves. Okay. Let me not talk about them. Okay, now we can answer. Which vertebral level is safe to perform a lumbar puncture in a neonate? Which one is going to be the answer here? A. 
Anyone? Okay, let's see. Okay, thank you. Which of the following nerves is in the substance of the parotid gland? Which one is going to be in the substance of the parotid gland? Okay, what 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 ganglia is going to the parotid? And what cranial nerve is there? What 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 cranial nerve? What is the name of that one? It's glossopharyngeal, isn't it? So glossopharyngeal. Remember what we said, the mnemonic, only one of the two athletes felt very good, happy, and victorious. So you have got this here, glossopharyngeal. Okay, let's look at this one. Sympathetic fibers in the greatest splanchnic nerve arise. Yeah, I was supposed to talk about this, but I didn't mention it. So you can just read it through. So I'll not talk about it. Cerebrospinal fluid is constantly produced by cerebroaqueduct, choroid plexus, diencephalon, brachial plexus. Which one? B, correct. Let me go to this one. The third ventricle lies in the cerebral hemisphere, diencephalon, cere cerebellum, brainstem. B also diencephalon. Okay. Which of the following is related to the nucleus? Nucleus, neurons outside central nervous system, neurons inside, nail fibers inside central nervous system, nail fibers outside. Which one is going to be the answer? Which one? So it's neurons inside the central nervous system. That's a cell body. That's the nucleus. Outside is called ganglia. And then nerves inside the central nervous system is tracked. Outside is called a nerve, like the axons. Okay. The domatom at the umbilicus is T8, T9, T10, T11. T10, good. Which of the following cranial nerves originate from the midbrain? Olfactory, oculomotor, what's the next one? Abducent facial. B, oculomotor. Okay, let me review. Remember we said four brain, you have got four brain, midbrain, and then for the end brain we had the pawns and the Oblongata. Here you have got one and two. Here you have got three and four. Here you have got from five, six, seven, and eight. The next four here, also the next four, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So mid brain is three and four. Okay, so oculomotor, that is correct. Which parasympathetic ganglia is responsible for the supply of the lacrimal gland? Lacrimal gland. Stellate, ciliar, otic, phenopalatine. Remember, C is otic. Otic goes to the parotid. So it is sphenoparatine. Which of the following cranial nerve is purely sensory? Purely sensory. Vestibular cochlea, glossopharyngeal, trigeminal trochlea. So remember, let me write the numbers one. Let me just remove space here. One, two, three, four, five, 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So from what you've been given, let me also write them only one of the two athletes felt. Is that felt? Okay, let me start. Only one of the two athletes felt. Felt is supposed to do what later? F. Felt very good, happy, and and what? Victorious. Actually, felt very felt very good, victorious, and. Happy. The victoria should come first. So what you've been given here is vestibular, cochlea, this one. What you've been given again is glossopharyngeal. Where is the glossopharyngeal? Nine. It's supposed to be nine. It's here. And then the next one is trigeminal five. Oh, it's five. Sorry, not this one. And then the next one is trochlea. Okay, also four has been given. So which one do you pick? Okay, the one which is purely sensory, sensory. Oh, it's this one, isn't it? This one I ticked was Vegas. Okay, so it's vestibular, go clear. Okay, during a fight, a man is stabbed in the lateral chest beneath the right arm. The wound does not enter the chest cavity. Physical examination reveals that the vertebral medial border of the patient's scapula projects posteriorly and is closer to the midline on the injured side. On return visit, the patient complains that he cannot reach as far forward, such as to reach for a door knob as he could there as he could before the injury. The nerve injured which the nerve injured which caused the, these symptoms is there. So he can't lift his hand to get to the door. Long thoracic. Now, long thoracic, we're talking about the winging of the scapula. Or maybe patient's scapula project. Okay. I think that you you are analyzing projects posteriorly. I think that they've mentioned that, isn't it? Yes. A person sustains a left brachial plexus injury in an auto accident. After initial recovery, the following is observed. The diaphragm functions normally. There is no winging of the scapula. Abduction cannot be initiated. But if the arm is helped through the first 45 degrees, of abduction, the patient can fully abduct the arm. From the amount of information and your knowledge of the formation of the brachial plexus, where would you expect the injury to be? Which one would you pick? Axillary, another one? Posterior cord? Okay, is there another option? E, superior trunk. Superior trunk. Oh, su suprascapular nerve. Okay, so for, for you to abduct the first 15 degrees from zero to 15, the muscle that is involved here is uh, supraspinatus. And then from 15 to 90 degrees, the muscle that is involved is a deltoid. And then the next, 50, uh, the next, like from 90 to 180 degrees, the muscle that is involved here, there are actually two, the serratus anterior and the trapezius. So here, 
we can't abduct but if we are helped through the the first 45 degrees we can do it so meaning we can't abduct initially so in other words the question is asking what nerve supplies the supraspinatus it's it's e okay and then what nerve supplies the deltoid the axillary how about the serratus anterior long thoracic so we should be able to know which one is going to be injured at which at which case so there are a lot of questions here there are a lot we can't answer them all okay let's come on this one let's answer it what is what is one one c7 what is two long thoracic nerve what is the three anterior division but this answer is not it's not complete so remember this is of the middle trunk you also have anterior division of the upper trunk or the lower trunk so if you say this you, you know how the department is isn't it so anterior division of middle trunk let's go to four what is four Post posterior cord, yeah? and then five median nerve, and then six on a nerve, and then seven musculocutaneous, and then eight. Which one are we saying? Saxillary? <laughs> Which one are we saying? Okay, the radio nerve should be this one. It continues. Huh? The, that's axillary. And then nine. This one. Upper trunk. And then ten. Sopra, sup, supra scapula. How about this one they've not named here? This one they've not numbered. This one, supra scapula. And then this one, dorsal scapula. How about this come a small one which is down here? Nerves to subclavius muscle. Uh, let's number this. These are the three which are here. These are the three. Starting with this one. Medio pectoral. Okay, good. And then the next one here. So this is the uh, medial cutaneous brachial. Wh which one is the brachial part? Which one is the arm? Which one is the forearm? Up or down? Okay, so it's arm. Um, so medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and then medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. How about this one which they have not men named here? lateral pectoral and then these three which are here these three here
Okay, so you have got upper on top, mid do on the mid do, and then lower on the bottom. Mid do subscapula is also called thoracodorso. Okay, let's name this one. You see, what is one? Cell body, what is nine? The nucleus, what is 10? Dendrites, what is 2? What is 2? So, that, so that's it. High lock, high lock. You, you forgot 10 and then 3? There's no other name. And then a three that see axon four. Myelin sheath. Okay, what is seven? <laughs> so you've seen that you've seen this one, they've specifically pointed, you can even see the nucleus. So what is forming the myelination there? Swani, yes, and then five. So the myelin is seven. What is five? Nodes of brain, yeah. And then what is that one at the end? Ah, then right at the end. <laughs> So that's the nerve terminal. And then what is what is what is this one? They've showed the arrow. Ha. Ah, bye. Where they've showed the arrow? What is that? It's going like that. <laughs> so what conduction will be present in this nerve? Saltatory conduction. So there will be jumping off. That is how the conduction is going to be happening. So there's an action potential which is going forward. Okay, so that is it. Hope we can answer this one. Draw a typical spinal nerve. That is how it came and they gave it nine marks. Okay, so we are going to end here. Thank you so much.